All right, continuing my refutation of Jacques Fresco's ideas. And by the way, yeah, I know that the activist orientation guide had, you know, had the names of Fresco, Peter Joseph, and that wife it is at the bottom. But this is clearly just Jacques Fresco's work. I mean, they added their names to it, but this is obviously Fresco. So I'm not going to have that argument. I say it's Fresco, and you disagree, whatever. You know what I mean. All right. At some point, I think it may have been Chapter 2 or Chapter 4 or something, he started talking about distorted value. Now, distorted value means something completely different than what Fresco said. You know, I have a feeling that Fresco flipped through a couple, you know, a couple economic textbooks and found some clever words and gave them his own meaning. And also he turned on the television and, you know, watched Ron Paul, and Ron Paul said some stuff, and so Fresco, you know, copied what Ron Paul said. But he completely missed the point. Anyway, back to distorted value. Apparently, according to Fresco, if I have a shirt on, let's say, you know, that has an advertisement on it, and I paid a – yeah, you got an advertisement, Ron Paul, yeah. And I paid money for it, you know, more money for it than, let's say, just a normal shirt. You know, I've committed some – you know, I've got a corrupt sense of – or a value, pretty much. I've got a distorted value somehow. I don't know. He didn't really make a whole lot of sense, but that's basically what he said, in that since this brand I have on my shirt, you know, doesn't have any utility on it, you know, I'm guilty of distorted values. I'm going to refute that now. All right. I have this book, Human Action, by Ludwig von Mises. All right. Now, this is a book. It has – I think it has a value, even though Fresco would probably argue that it has no intrinsic value. I mean, it's just paper and crap. But, you know, I think it has some cool – it's got words in it, and it's got some cool ideas. I read, but what I used this book for a few weeks ago, I just set it here, and we did our show, and it stayed here as a prop. And what I was doing, it was actually more of an advertisement, you know, sort of like how some people wear Nike on their shirt, you know, or whatever. I actually used this book as an advertisement to say, hey, you know, everyone out there, you know, if you can recognize this book, then you know what my values are, and so, hey, what's up? And I actually got a response. You know, someone – Like a Masonic, you know. Yeah, a Masonic hand sign. And I got a response. So this at one point was a book. You know, it had its utility as a book. But then I used it as an advertisement, and I made a connection with someone, a like-minded person as myself, by using it as an advertisement. And, you know, is that a distorted value now? I mean, I achieved the ends that I wanted. It seems it had value to me. So that's my refutation of Fresco and his distorted values. Well, Fresco basically plays it as if he has this kind of – what's the Archimedean perspective? It's a God's point perspective, the ability to see the whole entire world at a glimpse. And so he's speaking from, like, the perspective of a – some kind of fourth-party, you know, omniscient entity that can judge the true value of an object. And he'll say certain things have intrinsic value and other things don't have intrinsic value. And those are based on what he calls his natural laws. Oh, Jesus. So he creates natural laws whereby we could actually determine what has or has not value. And so he says that it's all objective. And he has to say it's subjective. He has to say that it's objective because it's obviously subjective, and he has to say the exact opposite in order for – to basically strike first. And that way we're on the defense. We're like, hey, no, that's subjective. He's like, no, I said that. It was objective first. And other people are like, yeah, it's subjective. What do you mean? He says that value is according to this basically very dated perspective on the ability of an object to, I guess, be scarce and the ability of an object to require human labor to exist. That's all value. That's all, like, you know, I guess as far as value, he assigns an object value according to those two factors. He says that gold has no inherent, quote, value. And then he'll say stuff that appeals to, like, the bleeding hearts and basically the mother and everybody, I guess, that, you know, things like food and clothing have value because everyone needs food and clothing and everything, you know? Obviously. 
I mean, there's a billion ways to get there, though. But, yeah, those things have value according to his, quote, natural laws. So you kind of start seeing that value to this man has a lot less to do with what's, quote, objective, and it has a lot more to do with his very particular worldview that he crafted over 90 years of isolation. And this guy isn't peer-reviewed at all, as far as he's called a scientist, by the way. And he created this worldview where he now has a definition of value for himself. And he can now go around claiming that certain things have value and certain things don't have value. And ultimately what it is, is things that don't fit within his worldview, he considers, quote, irrelevant and having no value. And, yeah. Or unnatural or something. And so so far as, as he doesn't understand Jeff's use of this book as an advertisement in order to basically communicate a certain ideal to the planet in order to attract like-minded people, so much as that's an invisible, kind of somewhat of an invisible um, effect that's happening, and only those who are in the know are privy to it, he would assign no value to it because he doesn't get it. And so much as anything that he doesn't get exists, it has no value to the man. And it doesn't, because it doesn't fit into his worldview of what the, the way the whole entire world should work. You know, and that's twisted. <laughs> that's, that's really fucked up. I mean, the whole entire notion of like respect for others is respect for other people's particular senses of values. I mean, what you are are what you value. You know, it's like your whole entire life is dictated by your ultimate wants. Everybody is born with a very particular set of wants. It's just like the same way, like, you know, you place a stem cell somewhere inside your body, and it'll kind of figure out what to do based off of how it finds a way to fit into its environment, and either it becomes a heart cell or becomes something else, right? But you respect it. You let it do what it wants to do in its own world, in its own little community, you know? If I think that gold has value, and people in my community think that gold has value, it has value, because it's all based off of basically what we call the jury of the local environment, the local community. We all think it has value, therefore it has value. And if you live, you know, 5,000 miles away, and you don't consider gold valuable, and... So you, don't trade in gold with us. Well, yeah, <laughs> and, and then we're both right, is the point. It's that gold has value to me, and it doesn't have value to you. There is no, quote, objective value. It's all based off just what you want to do. Yeah. Maybe we, we want to live in a technotopia. And so gold has a way of being untarnishing. You literally have gold like wiring that will work forever because it doesn't tarnish. It doesn't weather. It's always gold and it always conducts electric electricity. So if I wanted to build a technotopia, like, you know, a technopolis, you know, a city of computers, I would like to use a lot of gold. And the fact that there isn't one standard for the value of gold and the fact that your community 5,000 miles away doesn't value gold actually makes the whole entire thing work much better. Yeah, because then you can trade us your exactly. gold. Exactly. And we can both profit. No exploitation, we both profit. And that's the point, is that everybody should have their own particular self-perceived destinies where they want to achieve an ultimate end for themselves and the people around them should help them facilitate it. And one of the means that they help people facilitate certain things is through the exchange of money. If I have a certain requirement of a particular metal and I can't find it, then what I could do is I could put out a bulletin somewhere where it says, hey, I need gold because I want to build a technopolis, you know? And then someone else says, hey, we don't like gold, but we have 5,000 pounds of it. And I'm like, oh, well, here's two possi possibilities. Either we barter, as in like, okay, so what do you want? Oh, um, we, we like, in our city, we like weed. You know, that's all we like. And I'm like, oh, well, I don't have weed. So now I have to run th through some kind of weird, you know, like Grand Theft Auto sort of an errand where I <clears throat> go downtown and talk to, like, I guess... Weed dealer. I guess, yeah, weed dealer Bobby, whatever his name is. Yeah, and I have to get a hell of weed in order to, to, you know, send a bunch of weed through Fexia so you can send your gold my way. Or we could have a very common form of communication called paper, where by me working and by me basically achieving a certain form of, pro of some form of production, we create a means of exchange through the lowest common denominator called money. The fact that we all accept this thing is tradable and has, has very, um, I guess, non-specific value 
and it only exists not so much as it is – as has an ability to produce an effect, but only exists in the ability to maintain value in itself. I can now send you a shitload of money, and I don't have to go through all the trouble, and you send me your, you know, 20 pounds or whatever the hell of gold. And so that works, right? That works really well in terms of efficiency. But the ultimate side effect that occurs with money is actually something we're going to get into in the next chapter because there's a lot more significance going on here. And the way that evolution happened from what was called the barter system or just, you know, hunter and gathering system to the bartering system to whatever the heck, and then we got money, there was actually another dimension of something that was happening all the while that, you know, a lot of people don't touch upon. And it was explored by early 19th century economists that are literally just completely blacked out in our history books. So we'll, you know, get into that more next time. Thank you. 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 Thank you.